Now, the funny thing about the central bank, Federal Reserve, neither federal nor has any reserves, right? It's a private entity owned by the families, Rothschilds, Morgans, etc., um, owned by the banks, and its job is to enrich the bankers. That's its job. And in so doing, it steals wealth from the masses in the form of inflation. And from 1776 to 1913, a dollar was worth a dollar. From 1913 to today, it's now worth three cents. Before we get into the episode, I have to tell you about the simplest and best way to start mining Bitcoin, the Blockware Marketplace. Our new streamlined onboarding process means you can literally buy a Bitcoin mining rig and start mining in under 60 seconds. All of the machines available for sale in the marketplace are online right now at one of Blockware's facilities. You don't have to worry about lead times or finding a place to get your machine plugged in. Blockware has already taken care of that for you. You get to mine completely hassle-free. And if at any point you decide that you no longer want to mine, or if the price of ASICs increases and you want to capitalize on the higher value of your machine, you can list your rig for sale at any time and at any price. This platform has completely changed the landscape of hosted Bitcoin mining. And the best part is that this all takes place using Bitcoin and the Lightning Network. Get started today at marketplace.blockwaresolutions.com. This video is sponsored by Stamp Seed. You plan on holding your Bitcoin for decades, so you need to make sure that your seed phrase is documented in something that can last just as long. Stamp Seed's signature titanium plates and stamping kits do just that. If you simply write your Bitcoin seed phrase down on a piece of paper, it's vulnerable to fire, water, and all sorts of erosion that can happen over time. Make sure you keep it secure for years to come. Head to stampseed.com and use the code BLOCKWARE15 for 15% off the entire website. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the BLOCKWARE podcast. This week I have on Mr. Mark Yusko of Morgan Creek Capital. Mark, thank you for having me. Ah, uh, no, great, great to be here and uh, look forward to the conversation. Thanks for coming over. Yes, sir. So I want to start. I don't know if you're a big energy drink guy, but uh, no, but my son probably is. Okay, well, I'll gift you one to give to your son. So it, this is Sovereign. They just launched. It's a Bitcoin energy drink. Nice. Every can has free Satoshis if you take off really? the wrapper. Yeah. So wow. the chance of winning up to one million Sats with each can. It's so, very cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. They just launched I'll a Pacific Bitcoin. I uh, this is actually my first time trying one since I tried it the first time in Pacific. So. It's uh for those we're recording at like nine thirty in the morning, so maybe a little too early for an energy drink. Yeah, but yeah. actually, I'm gonna save mine for for posterity. Yes, uh, sir. Put it right here. Awesome. It's orange pill flavored. <laughs> orange pill flavor. Love it. Yes, sir. So I got a list of questions here, and I actually want to start out with something that might be like I don't want to come off like aggressive or anything, but you made some comments on a show about two months ago, and I just wanted to yeah, like, yeah. question you on these. So it was the Kitco News Show, and I'll just read your quote here. Yep. The idea of Bitcoin being the thing that everyone in the world uses to exchange value died pretty quickly after the white paper was written. Part of the problem is that the distribution of coins wasn't broad enough. Could you just clarify what you mean by that? Well, what I mean is that peer-to-peer electronic cash network um, is not really viable in in the i think the the sense that some people thought of originally which is you know you and i would would exchange it all the time and and it could you know the the, the chain would would process thousands and thousands of transactions per second and compete with visa um it's not possible right yeah and in in technology you can either be uh Secure or fast? And you got to choose one. And the Bitcoin blockchain chose to be secure. It's the most secure computing network on the planet. Hundreds of millions of transactions, never been handled. Not one fraudulent transaction. Think about how many times you had to get a new Visa card because they run on a mainframe computer on COBOL. And it's vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, a lot of attack surface. But they can process 30,000 or whatever the number is transactions per second. And Bitcoin's like six, something like that. So that, now I guess the, the flip side of that is, I think the, the criticism people would, would lobby back at me, at, well, no, you're just missing the point, is, is ultimately it is going to be the, the 
only thing that people exchange value in. Maybe. I mean, it's, it's certainly possible, um, but pretty unlikely. Think about uh, you got you to defeat all fiat. I think m fiat might defeat itself, hopefully. Well, but, it, but fiat has defeated itself over and over and over again throughout history, but it just rises back up. And so what do you think about the Lightning Network then? You think you know, we'll be able to build these these user-friendly and quick payment applications on top of Lightning? For sure, the only way to scale Bitcoin as, as the base layer is through L2s or L3s or L4s, which don't exist. Conceptually, they exist. Um, and Lightning definitely is there, but it's not really, um, really scaling the way you need it to. You know, there's a very small number of people on the planet that even know how to use Bitcoin in any way, shape, or form. Um, vast majority of people on the planet either don't know about it. There's Three billion people on the planet that couldn't even access it, even if they knew about it, because they don't have electricity. So, or or consistent electricity. But ultimately, things like lightning have to exist if Bitcoin is to be this this peer-to-peer -peer network. But at least so far, um, there's been a lot of hype, and at least from my understanding, not much progress. There's been some. Um, and, and look, we're investors in companies like Strike, where it's pretty amazing. I can take fiat and convert it into Bitcoin instantaneously, transfer it anywhere. You know, we're sitting at a world map here uh, on the table. They transfer it anywhere in the world instantaneously, and they can take fiat on the other side uh, at zero cost. Now, if Jack's listening, zero is the wrong number. Uh, so we we need to we need to make some money, um, and he knows that. But but you're trying to scale the the app and then monetize later, but. And and that is amazing, right? We're using the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, the rail, to exchange value, but that value is still fiat. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I think there's the Bitcoin network and Bitcoin, like what big B and little B, yeah, and little like B the and asset big B. in the network. Yeah, and and so the idea that everyone uses so my my quote my comment really i was i think i was was quoting somebody else on on uh funny how you know, things get pulled out of hour-long conversations not not you but but generally speaking uh you know people can can see 30 seconds of an hour long uh interview and they're like oh, oh you don't know anything yeah it might happen with this one too did you did you listen to any of the other things that, that we talked about. Um, but this idea that we're actually going to physically exchange Bitcoins, or Bitcoin, um, there really isn't any coins, right? There's no, how was it? It's always a, it used to be a gold disc and had a B and a C on it. And that was the original logo. And then it went to a gold disc with just a B on it. And then it went to the orange disc that we have today. And I always joke, you know, there's no gold and there's no coins, right? Literally, no gold and no coins. Um, so the problem with exchanging Bitcoin is the volatility, right? I can't, as a merchant, take Bitcoin if by the time I get it to the bank, I've lost 10, 15, 20%, whatever, whatever it happens to be over that, that day or week or, um, and you say, well, but that volatility will decline as more users get involved. Yeah, that's, that's logical. Um, but, and, and you can say every currency fluctuates. But think about it. It it fluctuates relative to something else. Mm -hmm. That's the whole time. One Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. It is it is one Bitcoin. Um, 
And what, what it fluctuates is not versus itself, but versus something else. So we price in dollars here in the United States. Other people price in other currencies. So in Argentina, they're not having a bear market in Bitcoin. It's all highs right now. It's it's getting yeah. So uh, so that's another thing where over time you either have to have all or none, right? You if 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 you and I exchange Bitcoin, but we still have to buy energy drinks in fiat dollars, then there's there's risk yeah. of of value diminution uh, or accretion. I mean, it could go the other way. Yeah, in the short term, anything can happen, really. I I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Um, I just think it takes more time, right? Bitcoin's only 15 years old, lightning even less than that. I think you know, we give this thing another one, two, three decades. We very well could be using Bitcoin on a, a day-to-day basis. And I think there's like, so another thing you said there was Bitcoin is is saving or it's saving, not spending. And I tend to agree with that, but I also think you can do both, right? Like with Sovereign, I, I could buy these in Bitcoin, right? The way I think about it is maybe I have a cold storage wallet that's saving every, you know, a percent of my income always goes to that long-term savings, whatever. And then I have a hot wallet with a few Satoshis on it. You know, if the value fluctuates on a short-term basis, so be it. You know, maybe I lose 5%, 10% here or there, but maybe I gain 5%, 10% here or there. And that can be the Bitcoin that I spend, right? So it's not necessarily any different from having a savings account and a checking account at a bank. It's just doing the same thing with Bitcoin. 100%. And, and you certainly can as a novelty, mm-hmm. right? There are very few people very few businesses, very few merchants, very few products uh, that you actually can do that. Yeah. I mean, there are some. Where's one right here? Um, And there are an increasing number of apps trying to solve that. Uh, But in the end, what they're really doing is a conversion into fiat. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Um, But the risk remains the same. If, If I took that dollar that I earned uh, a year ago. Well, actually, it goes the other way over the last year. I'm, I'm thinking since the bear market started in, in, in 21, you know, could have taken a dollar and, and you go spend it a year later and, you know, work 25 cents on the dollar. Mm-hmm. Now, in the past year, it's up 40%. Yeah. I guess over the long run, as Bitcoin continues to go up versus fiat, more often than not, you're going to end up on the good side of that that situation as a merchant. No question in my mind that 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 is true, that the ultimate direction of fiat currencies is down, right? The nature of the beast is they are created by the issuance of debt. I mean, most people don't really think about this, but uh, the things that we think about as money aren't money at all. Mm-hmm. They're currencies. Well, what's the difference? Well, money is an asset that exists in the absence of a liability. And the only thing that you know we use as money that that qualifies for that today is gold. Um, some might say silver, but but silver lost its its use case about a hundred years ago. Um, when it got ta- well, not even 100 years ago, probably 50 years ago, when it got taken out of coins and things like that. Um, but gold is at the base layer of money. Every country's central bank has gold uh, in their vaults. At least they say they do. Um, nobody actually verifies it anymore. Uh, but, but generally speaking, gold has been the base layer of money for 5,000 years. And then fiat is built on top of that by governments in the through the issuance of debt. So dollars are backed by debt, yen are backed by debt, euros are backed by debt. And and all of that results in a downward spiral in the value because you can't pay the debt back, right? Let's take the US debt today. It's thirty three and a half trillion dollars um with a T, right? Half of the- Truly, in like the last yeah, three weeks. Exactly. Exactly. It took like the first 150 years to get the first half trillion. Um, so, and that's just the law of large numbers. I mean, but, but generally speaking, the challenge is even if you taxed 
all of the wealth people in America, you couldn't pay the debt back. Mm. All the wealth. So income tax isn't going to do it. So what are you going to have to do? Well, you're going to have to print more money. Well, as you print more money, say simply, right? If that that sovereign is is a trillion dollars and I print another one, a trillion dollars, the value of those just fell by half. And and that's exactly what's happened. In fact, in the history of, of mankind, there have been 775 paper currencies. Three quarters of them no longer exist. It literally went to zero. And the quarter that are left are on their way to zero. So, you know, in the old days, uh, it was called a pound in, in the UK because you could exchange it for a pound of sterling silver. Oh, and then it's a- yeah. And, you know, today it would take you 174 pounds of sterling silver. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's that devaluation of the currency through the issuance of debt. And, and governments tend toward excessive debt. Why? Well, governments don't start out to be corrupt. Well, some do. But most of them don't start out to be corrupt. But they end up becoming corrupt because absolute power corrupts absolutely. And you go from capitalism and democracy or republic we're a republic, you know, you know, the U.S. is a republic, uh, democracy is a form of governance. But what happens is you go from that republic and, and, and respective rights um, to cronyism. And few people at the top get all the power and they want to enrich themselves. And so what do they do? Well, history tells us that empires wage war. So that's what you do. You wage war and you take over other people's stuff and you get richer. Or you just you know, invest in a bunch of bombs and missiles and ships and that makes you rich too. That's what, kind of what's going on right now. So that cronyism leads to dictatorship. Dictators eventually hyperinflate. Mm-hmm. And you look at history of, of you know, whether it's Zimbabwe or Venezuela, uh, you give a dictator absolute essentially monarchy power, they're going to destroy their currency through the use of too much debt. So the we think about Bitcoin as a replacement or as a safe haven. You had you had Larry Fink, right? Larry Fink, one of the most powerful people in the world, runs the largest asset manager in the world, who five years ago, you know, everybody knows, said it was just an index of money laundering. Now, yes, the other day when the, you know, the rumor came out that, you know, the ETF was approved, which I'll argue was, was a trial balloon yeah. to see what the reaction yeah, I want to was going to be. For sure. um, and then Larry comes on TV and says, look, there's a lot of people running for fl- you know, flight to safety and safe havens and gold and treasuries and, and Bitcoin and crypto. He said, is there there's a reason he can't say Bitcoin because of the ETF filing or something like that? I don't think so. I think Bitcoin is crypto. I mean, people don't like to see, you know, Bitcoiners are like, no, it's not. Like it is. It's cryptographically secure. Yeah, I would I would is agree with that, but I would say because I am a Bitcoin maximalist, I would say Bitcoin is crypto, but crypto is not Bitcoin. I like to distinguish between Bitcoin and everything else. Well, but everything else isn't crypto. It is crypto. I mean, they're all crypto. A cryptographically secure technology is a cryptographically secure technology. That is what it is. And to say Ethereum is not Bitcoin, Solana is not Bitcoin. I mean, that's just those are facts. And the 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 the, the max sees, I guess you you would be one, would say, well, there's gonna be one chain to rule all chains and only one chain. Okay. Prove it. I just think there's gonna be one money. Personally, in the sense, um, well, first, so so there's 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 two conversations here. One is the technology, blockchain technology, cryptographically secure blockchain technology. There are lots of there are lots of blockchains. The idea that there's only going to be one blockchain, prove it. I mean, somebody show me how you can scale on top of blockchain Bitcoin as the blockchain. And 
you know, if we think of Web3, Web3 is the internet of blockchains. That's what it is. We're, we're moving from centralized databases to decentralized, cryptographically secure. But I, the problem I see with that is I think we only need a blockchain for money, right? Because you mentioned earlier, you know, this is straight off between security and speed. And when I hear people in crypto talk about, you know, such and such crypto is better than X, Y, or Z crypto, it's because it's faster, it's, it can do more transactions, it can do all that. So I think as you're on the spectrum of cryptographically secure and then speed, I think it just progressively gets more centralized to be faster and optimized for all of that. And I think eventually you just end up back on all the other sorts of databases like your Google Cloud, your Amazon Web Services, et cetera. So today, that's, that's definitely true, but, but not tomorrow, right? There, there will be things built only on blockchains. Don't have anything to do with AWS. I mean, for right now, uh, NFTs, good example. So most NFTs are pointers from the Ethereum blockchain to some database, right? Some centralized database. Not ordinals, which reside on the Bitcoin blockchain. You know, I think ultimately you're, you're, you know, you said you, you're friendly with, with Jason, you know, one of my partners or uh, venture partners. And, you know, he burned his board ape and uh, put it on. Yeah, I think everyone's going to want to go to the most secure decentralized network, which is Bitcoin by far, because it has the most hash power, most proof of work going into it. Again, today it is one of a handful of proof of work. And I'm, I'm a huge fan of proof of work versus proof of stake. And the proof of stake people have tried to convince me otherwise, but, but I still like proof of work. Um, now, there are definitely drawbacks to proof of work. Um, and as the chain gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we're going to have to find a solution for for scaling or and the and I, I'm to, we'll let Jameson and, and the other developers figure that out. But um you know, there are applications for blockchains beyond money. So that's that's one. So let's talk about money for a second. So I said money, gold is the only money in the world. Everything else is currency. So can Bitcoin be digital gold. Well, it's a narrative that got, you know, after the peer to peer net, peer to peer network narrative died, and it did die, right? I mean, from from the launch in 2009, when that was I don't know, I still use pieces. Bitcoin peer to peer all the time, whatever I can. It's just not, you know, like it's not widely spread. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the number will grow over time. So I think that just the distinguish that when you say it died, people might hear that and think it could never work versus like it can work. It's just not a lot of people are doing it. Do you have money in a bank? Yes. Not a lot. <laughs> but but you have money in a bank, yeah. right? And and everyone I talk is anyone who makes the case that you know Bitcoin is the only money, prove it. Put all your money in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I would say it's, it's the in best a cold money. storage wallet. And don't talk to me if you've got the bulk of your wealth, which the average person, the bulk of their wealth, in the bank. Mm -hmm. And I get, you know, I like to surf spaces. So I'll go to a, a Bitcoin space and they're like, get out of here, you shit coiner. I'm like, I have way more Bitcoin than you. And that's not a brag. That's just, that's just fact. And they're like, yeah, but you own Ethereum and you own Solana. I'm like, I made a lot of money in Solana. I'm really happy about making a lot of money in Solana. Um, it's all most of it because you know, I think they have some challenges. But they, they, you know, their communities convinced me that they're working on it. So, um, but then I'll go to other you know, spaces like an ETH space. and like, get out of here, you maxi. I'm like, yeah, I probably own more Ethereum than you. Um, again, not a brag, just that's, don't, don't tell me I'm, I'm one thing. I'm a technology maximalist. I think this technology uh, and this combination of four technologies, or at least three technologies to, to deal with the fourth. So we call them the ABCDs of the digital age, AI, blockchain, chips, and data. Data is ultimately what this is all about. Mm -hmm. Everything's about data. You know, data is the new oil. Data will rule our lives. Data is what we're all trying to to move. And at the end of the day, what is what is money? It's going to be data, uh, ones and zeros, right? We don't physically have gold bars in our our homes anymore, and there's not even gold bars in in bank vaults. Um, it's just ones and zeros. So data. So 
A, B, and C, AI, blockchain, and, and chips are ways to capture, organize, analyze, and act on data. And so I'm a maximalist on all of those things. And I think blockchain is the best way to organize data. Yeah. And to, to the point of, of but let's, let's, let's switch back to money for a second. So if, if gold is money, which we'll accept that that is true. I'm actually doing a, a panel in Charlotte tonight on this exact topic. What is money? What's the future of money? And if Bitcoin is digital gold, why is it? Well, it has all the characteristics of gold. It's scarce. Its stock to flow ratio is good, meaning you know, if gold, the amount that's lost or stolen every year roughly equals the amount that's mined. So its stock stays relatively consistent. And same thing with, with Bitcoin, and, and that just gets better and better. In fact, the stock to flow is better than gold's mm -hmm. today, so it's more scarce. Um, but it's also not widely used. So the other part of my quote was, look, I, I, I think that a small number of people owning all the Bitcoins is, is an inferior system to broad just... Yeah, but on chain, we've seen it get more distributed over time. Uh, the trend has picked up significantly here, actually. It's, 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 the, and Gini coefficient is a bad thing, but if you look at the top, if you look at top addresses and, and, and adjusting for, I know, I do know that, you know, Coinbase is, is not one person. Uh, you adjust for all of that. It's still highly concentrated in a very small number. Yeah, but you still have one and a half million that's going to get mined over the next hundred something years. So even latecomers, they'll still have the chance to get Bitcoin in. Plus, because it's divisible into Satoshis, everybody can, you know, could be widely distributed, even if a large chunk of the pie is consolidated with a few users. But but let's let's think about this. So if 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 it was distributed at basically zero value, point oh 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 three three cents in the beginning, and only a small number of people got it, and now it's 26,000 and tomorrow it's 260,000. Those people that are latecomers are getting a smaller, smaller, smaller proportion. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a perfect balance though because there's this paradox where money needs to be scarce like gold or Bitcoin, but also widely distributed. I think Bitcoin's having supply schedule is perfect at solving that problem because if all 21 million had been released at once, obviously that would be a huge problem. But you also, you want to benefit early newcomers to it, right? Like if you're the first one to figure out Bitcoin, if you're, you know, how Finney mining in 2009, you should get more Bitcoin than someone who comes a hundred years Why? later. Why? Because you're the first one to discover the new money. I don't, Why? I think that's more, it's, that it's fair and open, right? It's nobody was, anybody who was alive was, was, it was an open network. Anybody could have mined from the very beginning yeah. if you knew about it. But you had to know about it. Well, that's information asymmetry right there. That's, all investing is built on, right? If you know something that other people don't, if you figure out something before the market figures it out. It's supposed to be an investment. It's not supposed to be hoarded by a, a precious few to control the masses. I mean, that's, that's what it's been used as. But that's not what it's supposed to be. I mean, to the point of, of if we want equality, right, then it should be a, a broader distribution. And it it's an interesting, look, we all justify current, situation. We justify our height. We justify our, our status in life. We just, I mean, it's, what, it's what I wanted. Probably if you were to yeah, map it out, maybe, maybe, maybe not. And so if somebody happened to be cypherpunk or friendly with Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he, she, they are, I'll go, he self-identified once as a he, so we think it's a he or maybe a group of he's. Um, maybe it's the NSA, you know, maybe it's the Chinese government, who knows? But but if you're friendly with those people and and you got a big, big stack, just because you were friendly with those, that's not so fair. I mean, and anybody could have participated though. I think that's well, I mean that's that's on them, right? And people well, people there's still people that don't know about Bitcoin, right? You wouldn't you figured it out early, right? So, you know, 20, 30 years from now, I mean, maybe you'll give away all your Bitcoin, but I'd imagine you wouldn't necessarily do that because, you know, you were smart, you were foresightful, you've seen it ahead of time, you've seen the debasement of fiat currency, you've put in the work to figure out 
what this thing is. So I think it's a quality of opportunity, right? Maybe not necessarily a quality of outcome. I mean, I guess, I guess if you, if you equilibrate it to gold, um, gold gets mined and then gold gets sold. It doesn't, doesn't get mined by everybody. And everybody did have a chance to go mine it. Most miners didn't make money. So yeah, I guess there's, there's an equivalence there. Um, and it, it has functioned as money uh, for a long time. And I guess it's just the time scale is different. You know, it took gold thousands of years to achieve its current level of valuation. It's like 10 trillion, isn't it? Well, that's, that's the total value of gold above ground. But jewelry and chalices and you know, the gold leaf on the gold dome at Notre Dame don't count. You wouldn't count? I would consider, consider that, that like, like a monetary, monetary value, value because if- No, that's a commodity. Those are, those are commodities. Well, if gold wasn't, if it didn't have this like pristine, like if it wasn't a wealth sort of- bearing asset right i don't think people will be walking around wearing gold watches i think part of it's the clout uh aspect of it which sure. is why it's used sure. and stuff like that but but, but it, it but either way you, i think it's, it's bullish, bullish for bitcoin yeah, right because no, it's, it's fair you could you could in theory uh you could melt down your earrings uh or your watch and and sell it yeah you don't you don't get you know the full value right if you could sell your watch to a pawn shop you're gonna get you know 50 cents on the dollar or something but okay that's fair. I, I'll, I'll adjust my thinking on it. But, but let's let's say it's seven and a half trillion or eight trillion. Um, took a long time to get there. Yeah, and a lot of people in the world own gold. Mm. Lots, like all over, you know, emerging markets everywhere. Governments, lots of people own gold. Um, and we've gone from you know kind of zero to half a trillion. Pretty quickly, in the scheme of things, fifteen years, uh, and it's it's not widely distributed. But I, I I can see the point. You know, gold probably wasn't very widely distributed when the Knights Templar. It's also not used as a currency anymore today either, and it still has you know five, ten trillion, whatever it is. That's you know orders. That's multiples for Bitcoin, right? If Bitcoin is at least as good as gold, which I think you and I would agree, it's much better than gold. So, so gold's more divisible and more portable. Yeah. So that's that's so theoretically it should at least conquer gold's market cap, even if it doesn't become a widely used currency. Oh, look, I I I've said many times mm -hmm. on 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 the record that that, that will happen. It's art. It, it's it's easy for me to see gold equivalents. I mean, I have a hashtag for it: um, Bitcoin gold, Bitcoin gold equivalents. So that that's easy, and. You know whether it's five trillion or ten trillion um, doesn't really matter to me. That that's easy. the The harder one is the jump. And look, Murray Stahl, right? Murray on the podcast, and and he'll he'll make me seem absolutely bearish because he's so wildly bullish, and and he makes a very elegant case for uh, why Bitcoin will replace. All money, mm -hmm. um, or all currency, because it's not really money, but currency. And and look, his argument is is elegant. The challenge is it, it kind of defies history. So in history, we have Gresham's law, which is bad money crowds out good, and that has been the case for millennia. And uh, there's lots of reasons why. And he's arguing for reverse Gresham's law that good money crowds out bad. And said it it makes perfect sense that you would want a better store of value versus a less good store of value. Yeah. Uh, it makes perfect sense if you listen to Jimmy Song that you wouldn't want to be a slave to to your capital, that you wouldn't want your hard earned wealth. To be devalued by um, all that makes sense, but but the idea that that Bitcoin is going to displace all of fiat and be a hundred trillion dollar asset, which is global M two, um, I'm not there. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm I definitely don't think it'll happen overnight. But if 
the dollar hyperinflates like a lot of fiat currencies have, then I guess Bitcoin will emerge as the replacement. He tweeted something. Well, not necessarily, right? B could replace it. Euro could replace it. And other things could replace it. I would think if the dollar went down, then all the other fiats would likely go with it. Well, that's not necessarily how it works, right? Because remember, you, you price all the other in relation to the dollar. Like we talk about the B in relation to the dollar. And the B is actually strengthened relative to the dollar because that's their plan, right? The Chinese want to be the world reserve currency. They're now a world reserve currency. They want to be the world reserve currency by 2050. So that's a long time from now, but that, that is their plan. Now, whether they'll achieve it, I don't know, but, but it doesn't, the dollar declining doesn't mean that Bitcoin wins. Bitcoin priced in dollars wins. So does gold, so does silver, so does platinum. Anything, anything priced in dollars. Yeah, I would just think Bitcoin probably be the biggest winner. Can we talk about CBDCs? Because you tweeted recently, I'll read your quote verbatim. Um, you find it on this thing. Yeah, if you aren't terrified at the prospect of a CBDC, then you just aren't paying attention. I think as we get, as the macro sort of deteriorates and we get more inflation, historically what authoritative governments have done is price controls and capital controls, which a CBDC would make that a piece of cake for them to implement. So, you know, I guess my question is, do you think a CBDC is likely within the next 10 years? And how do you think they would implement that? Would it be a brand new sort of Fed wallet? Or do you think maybe they'd co-opt like a stable coin? Or how do you picture that? I mean, lots of the great, great points. I mean, I absolutely believe it's coming. And, and, I, and I think it's pure evil. I think I, I stand by what I said. If, you, if you're not terrified of a CBDC, you're just not paying attention. I mean, a, a central bank digital currency is the worst of all worlds. Uh, digital fiat, programmable fiat, is, is a complete dystopian nightmare. And, and look, the guy from the BIS, you know, I used to call him Jabba the Hutt. You know, <laughs> he, doesn't, he looks more like the Kingpin from Spider-Verse movie. But, I mean, Augustin Karstens or whatever his name is. Um, I mean, he's the most scary person on the planet. I mean, he, he talks for a minute and 47 seconds on, well, of course, we could control the money and how you spend your money and when you spend your money and if you spend your money. I mean, imagine a world where you get paid on Friday and you have a couple cocktails and you drunk text about the president, you wake up on Saturday and your money's worth 75 cents on the dollar. Or um, you go to Target to buy stuff and Walmart has paid the government more that month so your money doesn't work at Target anymore. Mm -hmm. It only works at Walmart. Like, that could never happen. Sure, shit could happen. Yeah. Absolutely could happen. And, and then there's just the whole surveillance issue of the one, and again, Maxis won't like me for this one either, but one of the challenges of, of all networks, blockchain networks, Bitcoin in particular, is I don't want all my transactions on chain to be seen by everybody. I, I think that's a bug, not a feature. Um, and someone's got to solve that. And I guess there are things like RBG and others that are trying to work on that. Um, but, but the idea that just because I gave you a Bitcoin now, everyone can see where that Bitcoin was and what I did with it and what I bought with it. I mean, or that, or that I even gave you Bitcoin. I mean, but, but we have it, right? Venmo, which I don't really use. But the idea that it sends me notifications of what my friends are spending yeah, their money so on. Yeah, that's so weird. I don't know why people why? leave those it notifications on. So... Bizarre. Yeah. I mean, that's that's freaking me out. Yeah, I guess most people don't care about financial privacy because you can literally scroll through and my friends, I see exactly what they spent money on. I, I have a I have a wallet and and again this is more this is more Ethereum based, but but same is true for, for Bitcoin wallet. Uh and I you know I have stuff in there and people can go and they can look and see exactly what I have in my wallet. I don't love that. Now you say, well, but you don't have to let people know it's your wallet. 
some people have been successful at that. Yeah, I think if you learn UTXO management, I think that's a skill on its own that like most Bitcoiners, like even I've been in Bitcoin about two and a half years. It wasn't until about a year ago that I actually figured out basically how UTXOs work. Like you don't want to, you want to send certain chunks of Bitcoin to people, but not others because then it exposes your whole stack. I think there are definitely tools to make Bitcoin very private, but it's just not a common skill and it's something people need to practice to be able to do. Absolutely. And, and, and so it's just, CBDC is worse than that. Oh yeah, right? that was an worse. like orders orders of magnitude worse in terms of the surveillance and and the control. But and, and look, it it exists today. Inside they they have a version of a of a digital renminbi, and and now we've all seen some of the dystopian stuff that's happened in there, and it's not uh, as bad as as the Western press would would have you believe. Uh, you know, we have an office on the ground in Shanghai with people that live there and work there and they're, they're not, you know, being restricted from traveling and yada, yada, yada. But, but if you have a bad social credit score and you did something wrong, you know, bad things happen. But look, we have, we have lists of people in the United States and if you do something really, really bad, you get voted and, uh, you're on a list and people can see it. And so, but, but that on steroids, it's just not a world. That I don't want to live in. And, you know, so what's the option? Well, so you could move. Um, but if all the governments do it, then, then you have a problem. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of central bank digital currency. Now, Fed now is not a central bank digital currency. So Fed now is simply a settlement layer that's better than what we have. So that's a good use of, of blockchain technology to, uh, you know, the fact that banks are closed more hours than they're open and, you know, Fedwire is a 70-year-old technology and all that stuff. That all needs to get fixed and it will, but it's a slippery slope to CBD. Yeah, for sure. I think this is part of why I love America, though, <laughs> because we, the states can do their own thing, right? I think if there was a totalitarian central bank digital currency, a lot of states would just reject that outright and hopefully choose Bitcoin. Hopefully North Carolina, where we're at, would be one of the states that would reject the central bank digital currency. Yeah, I I don't think it would happen. Look, states are so dependent on federal money, they'll do what the government wants. And and you know, a lot of states say they're gonna secede or they're they're not gonna do what the government wants. Very few uh will go against. You know, for years, you know, marijuana wouldn't get legalized because they threatened to, you know, pull highway funding. And and then, you know, the winds of change got enough that people said, oh, whatever, we don't care anymore. Um, and so, Well, I guess with, with COVID, it sort of happened. There were certain states that were very uh, against that as, you know, I guess marijuana is more of like a peripheral issue. But when it comes down to core freedom issues, like you can't leave your house you, because of this virus or whatever. Some of the states were like really, really outright against that. I mean, Ron DeSantis in Florida was very outspoken against the lockdowns. I think a central bank digital currency would be met with sort of the same enthusiasm. But, but we're not, well, I, I don't think we're going back to the free banking era, right? Andrew Jackson tried this. It was a total failure. Um, you know, he didn't renew the second uh, banks, the second national bank's charter and said, everybody just issued their own currency. And it was a nightmare. And we had the worst depression in the history of the United States, worse than the Great Depression. And uh, 30 years later, we had to reverse it. But, you know, you can't have a Texas currency or a Florida currency. Well, they can use Bitcoin. Well, but they can't, right? It, it, it doesn't, there, there aren't systems today. And maybe there will be in the future, but there aren't systems today to make that feasible. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think, Maybe where we disagree on stuff is well. I don't even know that we disagree. I think it's just take it's just something that takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It's just different time horizons. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Right? That was very well said. And, and it's it's you know you can say well I'm short Tesla I'm long Tesla. You could both be right. It's wildly overvalued. It doesn't mean it's not a good company. It doesn't mean they're not going to produce a lot of cars. It's not a software company, by the way. Everyone says software companies cars. And cars actually, by the way, sit idle. 95, 96% of the time, those cars out there are not gathering data, they're gathering dust. You know, 
And it's just kind of funny, but it's just a time horizon question. So I do, I do believe in the Bitcoin blockchain. I do believe in Bitcoin being a better form of money. I do believe it has the potential to be the global asset settlement layer. Mm -hmm. We're so far from that. It's yeah. just not even funny. It doesn't mean we won't get there. You know, when, when DARPAnet was the internet and there were like five nodes, it was better than having zero nodes, yeah. but it wasn't the internet. And even when the internet was created in 1991, it wasn't the internet because it needed Mark Andreessen to create the browser to allow the average person, you know, you talk about UTXOs, most people are like, call the UTXO. No. Right? Just no. And you know, it's like when people say, not your keys, not your coins. There are plenty of people, they're never going to hold their own keys. They're never going to use cold storage. Just zero chance. It's like I think it's more of a responsibility thing than a technology because it's not easy. Like 12 words is pretty easy to remember and keep safe, but I think people don't want to put all that weight on their shoulders. Well, no, no. It's, it's, it's like, look, in theory, we should all put our money, our money, in our, because then it's our money. Mm -hmm. But what do we do instead? We put it in the bank, and now it's the bank's money. Mm -hmm. No, it's my money. No, it's not. Read, read the fine print. It's the bank's money. You have an IOU, and it works most of the time. But why do we do that? Convenience, right? Safety, security. I don't want people coming to my house. I mean, I just had a friend. This is a crazy story. Um, she's not even like a major whale. I mean, she's a a baby whale but she's not a, she's not a, a giant whale like you know people out there she just got swatted people physically called her said give up your seed phrase she wouldn't do it while she's on the phone they sent a swat team to her house like like literally like threatening to you know and you know said look there these people are terrorists they've killed people inside the house I mean, it was bad. Now, didn't end badly. I mean, she's fine. Um, it's not laughed about. I'm like, how are you laughing about that? that that's terrifying. Yeah. You know, Jameson Lopp moved from North Carolina because the same thing happened to him. Um, so, I, you know, $5 wrench risk is real with a bare asset. You know, people come into your house. I, I got in a debate with someone in a, in a Bitcoin space. And he's like, I'll never give up my seed phrase. I'll go to my grave. That doesn't help your family or anybody else. I mean, by the way, they won't point the gun at you. Yeah. They'll point the gun at your... Well, it's a multi-sig, so it can't even access it right now anyways, right? Yeah. You know, and, and, keys and, but, are but distributed is, across continents. Exactly. And, but that, that doesn't matter if we fall into this, you know, lack of rule of law. Yeah. You know, in theory... Banks used to get robbed. And they still kind of get robbed, but you don't see as many bank robberies. Mm -hmm. right? We don't see people riding up on horses and, and robbing banks. Um, and it's more sophisticated and knacking and, and like, and, but people still rob banks because that's, they asked Willie Sutton a long time ago, why do you rob banks? Well, that's where they keep the money. <laughs> so, okay. Um, and, and sir, people, rich, wealthy people have been kidnapped for years. Um, if you go to the wrong place at the wrong time, drive the wrong car, you know, whatever, uh, too public on, you know, central social media, you, you put yourself at risk. Yeah. But we still have a pretty good rule of law, generally speaking. I mean, there's some stuff around the world happening right now that, that does maybe not. But where we live today, I'm, I'm not sitting, I don't, I don't sit here worrying that people are going to rush in here with guns and, and take our stuff. Yeah. Like if it was back in the 1800s, we would worry about that. But bearer assets have unique risks. So the average person doesn't want to take those risks. Mm -hmm. So they're going to use a Coinbase, they're going to use a Kraken, or they're going to use a, a Gemini. And that's fine. If you're saying, well, then they don't own Bitcoin. Fine, whatever. They're, they're, my dad's really happy. He thinks he owns Bitcoin. And I'm not going to hold his keys for him because if I lost him, then all hell would break loose. He's perfectly happy. Um, and to your point, there's savings and spending. For, for savings, 
for long-term off the grid running money, yeah, you probably want it in cold storage, but someone's got to manage it. Yeah. Or not that someone has to be you. And if you're not technically proficient, bad things can happen that aren't reversible. Mm -hmm. Now, you say, well, but if you buried your gold in the backyard and forgot where you buried it, it's gone forever. Or if you, uh, you know, put your money someplace and you lost the key to the safe, mm -hmm. you can't get it. So, you know, that stuff does happen. Yeah. There's lots of money that's lost or stolen every year. So this is probably a good point to segue to the ETF because that's basically what you're describing in a nutshell. And obviously you're, you're a huge TradFi guy and this ETF is designed for TradFi folks, right? They can buy Bitcoin basically within their brokerage like they normally do and they don't have to worry about all these uh, hurdles with education and, and self-custody and everything. So what are your overall thoughts on the ETF, a timeline you expect it to get approved? And then what are your thoughts on the what happened Monday with the, the fake news release and the price just up and down 10% in like five minutes? Yeah. I mean, lots, lots of questions in there and lots of thoughts. So uh, I've said all along, and I've actually said this long before BlackRock even applied. I said there will only be one approval and it will be BlackRock. And that's the way it is. And sucks. You know, the Winkabas twins should have got approved the day they, they applied. They were the first. And it should have been approved. And this, this idea that, you know, markets are manipulated. Oh, you mean more than the triple levered, you know, S&P ETFs that have lost 99.9999999% of their value? Mm -hmm. or, or, you know, gold futures that have been manipulated and JP Morgan paid a billion dollar fine last year for manipulating the price of gold? You mean more manipulated than that? And, and Jay Clayton now that he's out even says, well, oh, yeah, maybe I was kind of making that up. Um, but he didn't say it quite that way, but, but that's, you can read the body language that, yeah, yeah I had to say, I had to say something. Um, and, you know, the guy in charge now, he's, he's got handlers that are telling him what to do. And, um, but Larry's part of the group that's in charge and they're going to get approved. So I actually thought it was 50, 50 that would happen yesterday. Um, the seventeenth was was kind of the the day for the the two that were ahead of BlackRock in line. Um, we own little pieces of both of them, uh, Amun twenty one shares and Bitwise. And as much as I'd like them to get approved, because look, if you ain't first, you're last. And we've seen that with 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 the Bitcoin futures ETF. We've seen it with with all all these ETFs. You know the the come along lately get some. But the first one out gets the, the mass of, of the money, mm -hmm. the bulk of the money. So I I knew that they would deny Kathy and I knew they'd deny Hunter and the gang and um, give them extensions. I thought there was a 50-50 chance to get approved. I think now we got another 90 days that pushes it into the new year. Um, that's probably more likely. Um, but Monday changed things. Monday was clear in my mind, clearly a trial balloon, uh, to see kind of how it would fall in, in the media. And, um, I think that's, there was a, Paul Romer, uh, may not know that name, but he won the Nobel prize four or five years ago for something called the law of increasing returns. And basically says that it's not the best technology that wins, it's the technology that gets critical mass first. And the year before he won it, NYU, where he was, uh, was testing their website because they thought he was going to win and accidentally hit publish yeah. on the Friday before the Sunday announcement. And so everybody's like, oh, Paul Romer won. Well, he didn't win that year. And he did win the next year. Now, did he win the next year because he deserved it or because they were like, Jesus, the, the world thinks he won, so we better give it to him. Um, uh, like Rocket Ishmael, everyone thinks won the Heisman Trophy in 1986, but he didn't. Ty Detmer did. Like, who the hell Ty Detmer? Like, you know, he was quarterback at BYU and he won, but it should have won. They never gave Rocket a Heisman, even though he had a, you know, 16-year career or whatever. My thing um, happened with Joel, Joel Embiid and the NBA MVP this yeah. year. Yeah, yeah. So I think 
what what is there's another there's a conspiracy theory view on what happened Monday too, which is uh, the SEC is in a tough spot in that pretty much everyone, and I do mean everyone, now agrees that this thing needs to get approved. But if you can go back to the market manipulation argument, why it hasn't been approved, then you can stall some more. So if the goal, which is, is the narrative that's trying to be, be created by saying, oh, see, this proves how manipulated it is. Somebody spread a rumor and the price moved 10%. Like, versus what? You mean when companies announce products that they don't have ahead of time and their stock moves or people announce, you know, mergers that don't happen and the stock, I mean, fake news happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but, but that's, that is one alternative view that, that it wasn't, you know, an accident or a, uh, trial balloon to see how how it would feel but rather a way to say see i told you total manipulated market we can't approve this thing that's possible yeah i think it was i guess i don't really know what it was but it just gets me excited right if that's what happens in a 15 minute span on people thinking the etf has been approved now imagine what's going to happen when it actually gets approved well i mean that the numbers are 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 easy and this is just uh, supply and demand so uh, DBTC uh, is the only thing that that advisors can use today. Mm -hmm. So you know, registered investment advisors, and it's got about twenty billion bucks in it, and it's prohibited at a whole bunch of RAs. Like you know, I say I have a, I have a family harmony account uh, at UBS, meaning my brother in law works there, so that's why I have an account. Uh, I love my brother in law, but I wouldn't have an account there if. It weren't for him. And I can't buy GBTC. I can't buy, you know, blockchain mining or Bitcoin mining stocks. I can't. I, you buy MicroStrategy? Uh, nope. Nope. Can't buy it. I mean, it's, they, they, they block everything. And look, that's their prerogative. It's a private company. Uh, and I could change, but, but I don't. Um, long story short, uh, when the BlackRock ETF is approved, all of those firms, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, UBS that have blocked it to this point will immediately to buy it because their clients want it. And that's, and Eric Balchunas, Balchunas, I'm not how you pronounce his name, but I love Eric. Um, it's like Yusko, Yusko, nobody, I, I know who knows me when they say Yusko, but um, although the other half of the clan does say Yusko, you know, the other half, but uh, he says there's 300, no, $30 trillion, $30 trillion. Uh, I get my zeros right. $30 trillion of money in these RAAs that don't allow it today. Uh, if you get 0.1%, that's 30 billion. Okay. 30 billion doesn't sound like a lot on a half trillion dollar asset, but it's not a half trillion dollar asset. Yeah, there's only so. two. Two million something on exchanges, and then two million that have been moved within the last six months. So it's pretty liquid. I mean, it's it's about a, let's say it's a hundred billion that that moves. Um, so thirty bill thirty billion on a hundred billion that'll move the price, but it's not going to be point one percent, right? I think it goes to one percent. Now we're talking three hundred billion. Now three hundred billion on a hundred billion free float. Now you're talking a big move. And yes, twenty billion of that amount of GBTC, because there's no reason to own GBTC if you can you know, two percent if you can own you know BlackRock and pay fifty basis points or whatever they're mm -hmm. going to charge. So there'll be a short term selling, but you know offset. So it probably won't go up quite as quickly. But I think inevitably you're going to get a one percent allocation to people's portfolio. And some may be even higher, but you know that supply and demand fixed supply. We know we know the growth of the supply, and we also have this challenge that whole bunch that's lost or stolen. There's a whole bunch that 
can't move either because multi-sig problem or uh, just holders are going to hold. Um, but that when when that gets approved, it it's going to move move price and price movement is a form of validation for market. Mm -hmm. I mean, Apple stock was in the toilet for decades until finally people said, you know, I don't like my IBM PC anymore. I want the Apple PC. Oh, but the, you know, your company won't support it. And, you know, so for years they had a, you know, whatever, eight, nine, 10% market share because it was the artists and the graphic designers and people who knew it was a better operating system. Today, you know, it's what I use. And, and there's still things that it doesn't do exactly well because Microsoft, you know, makes it hard, but it works 95% of the time. Yeah. And, and it's better at, at most things. Mm -hmm. I definitely think this ETF, when it gets approved, like you said, even 1%, that's just going to be a massive, massive move. And at that point, you could start seeing institutions FOMO and maybe increase their position to 2, 3, 4, 5%. So definitely... This ETF is really going to open the floodgates. And I want to be respectful of your time too, because we're at, we're at 1030 here. So my last question, I ask this to all the guests that come on now is, what does Bitcoin mean to you? Hmm. Um, Bitcoin is uh, an evolution of, of computing power. You know, I believe the Bitcoin blockchain is the most powerful computing network the world has ever seen. Um, it's a form of sovereign money, meaning it's a form of, of money that, that can't be controlled by governments. Um, so I like that. Yeah. So, I mean, if I, if sum it up in a word, I'd, I'd probably, you know, Bitcoin is freedom, right? It's, it's freedom from, from the tyranny of, of, of government. Uh, and the oppression of inflation. Inflation is oppression. It's and it has been for you know since the creation of the Fed. And you know, I think what people just don't really understand and appreciate, mostly because our lives are pretty darn good. You know, Touchwood life is, is pretty awesome in America, in Europe, in Europe, in you know, most of, of Latin America, South America, there are certainly pockets of place where life is great. And and not life isn't great for every single person on the planet. Lots of people struggling and suffering. You know, I'm I marvel that you know a country where we spend twenty billion a year on weight loss, we have ten million kids who go to bed hungry every night. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. right? We have plenty of calories. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Obviously we have plenty so of calories. Quite the surplus for most people. Uh but we just don't we don't care enough to to make that work. Um, so we have lots of problems, but but life, generally speaking, pretty damn good. Um, but but that said, we're victims of this pilferage that you know started in the 1600s when the Rothschilds created the first uh, central bank. And you know it's funny. I went on vacation this year. Uh, to Spain and Portugal with my, my son has a, a nanny has taught him Spanish since he was five weeks old. And so he's bilingual. I'm not, but, uh, she wanted to take us to see her homeland in, in Spain and visit her kids. And then we went down to Portugal and for years I talked, I told the story about world reserve currency. So in the 1400s into the 1500s, Portugal was the world reserve currency. Think about it. Little Portugal, size of Indiana. The most powerful currency in the world. How the hell did that happen? Well, because they controlled all the gold, because the new world didn't exist. There was no America, there was no South America, there was no India. There was just, you know, little Spain and Portugal, and ships left and discovered all these new worlds. And one of my fun facts I learned uh, there were no horses, cows, pigs, or sheep in America or South America. Really? None. Zero. They were all brought over? They were all brought over from Spain and Portugal. And there were no tomatoes in Italy and no potatoes in Ireland. All of that came from South America, which is amazing. That's what trade does. Um, but the other thing that, that was cool was, okay, so then Portugal lost to Spain. 
Okay, that made sense. Spain was bigger. They came down and conquered them as they're on the isthmus. Uh, but then Spain got conquered. Now, Spain had the most powerful armada, the most powerful navy. They were the world reserve currency. They had all the gold. Um, and what happened? Well, the Rothschild family created the central bank in the Netherlands. Again, Netherlands about the size of Ohio. Um, how the hell did they beat Spain? They printed money out of thin air and hired mercenaries and created a giant army to beat Spain. And they had the world reserve currency. I mean, just think about that. The Netherlands? Um, but then they got taken over by Napoleon and France took over for a while. Uh, and in that takeover, uh, half of the Rothschilds fled to Europe. I mean, I'm sorry, to the UK. And a number of years later, they set up the Bank of England and they printed money out of thin air and assembled the most powerful navy and they beat Napoleon. And so the UK became the superpower and the world's reserve currency. And the sun never set on the British Empire until 1913 when we, coincidentally, set up a central bank. Now, the funny thing about the central bank, Federal Reserve, neither federal nor has any reserves, right? It's a private entity owned by the families, Rothschilds, Morgans, et cetera, um, owned by the banks. And its job is to enrich the bankers. That's its job. And in so doing, it steals wealth from the masses in the form of inflation. And so from 1776 to 1913, a dollar, which by the way, we took from the Rothschilds, it was called the Reichsdollar in the Netherlands. And so we shortened it to the dollar. And from 1776 to 1913, a dollar was worth a dollar. A little fluctuation around that crazy period uh, with uh, the free banking era, which was a problem. Um, when they didn't have a national bank, mm -hmm. but 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 well, and, a, and a civil war, um, but it was worth a dollar. From 1913 to today, it's now worth three cents a dollar, and that's that thing of inflation. And that construct is just so debilitating to me. In that we are all again, as Jimmy Song so eloquently says, we're debt slaves. And the only way to liberate ourselves from that is to have a deflationary currency like Bitcoin instead of an inflationary currency like fiat. And, and so that's why, you know, libertad, liberty, freedom, whatever you want to call it, it's really what, what Bitcoin is. And it'll take time, um, you know, for everyone to get it, as we've talked about. It'll take time for people to have enough of their, their wealth uh, denominated in it to, to really be meaningful and useful in their life day to day. But to have a piece that says you're running money, you're F you money, whatever you want to call it, um, total necessity. Yeah. Because, look, do I think the dollar is going to hyperinflate like Weimar Republic? No. Do I think... Uh, you know, the cult of Kelton tried to do that post lockdowns with doubling the money supply. But we've been a republic for 247 years, it took 245 years to print 10 trillion, and then we did it in 18 months. Insane. Mm -hmm. And Fed's working hard to try to reverse some of that. We actually had negative money supply growth for the first time in a hundred. Yeah, it's crazy to look at the chart. And it's also crazy that people don't think that's going to end up in a recession. Exactly. So lots of things that, that point you to, you know, if, say, if you're, if you're not following Bitcoin, if you're not investing in Bitcoin, if you don't have any exposure, that's my hashtag get off zero, you know, we created way back when, uh, when Pomp and Jason were around. You guys coined and, that? Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, 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 that's my line. Yeah. I mean, um, Pomp might say he invented it, but I invented it. Um, but, uh, and I've been hashtagging it since 2017 and, um, it's a good one. It's cause it's, I think the best catchphrases are ones that outlive the creator. I didn't even know where that came from, but yeah. it's well, perfect. And, and the key is 
zero is the wrong number. I'm not saying you should have all your money, and I'm not, um, because at least for now, we still live in a fiat world, but, but zero is the wrong number. And every human being, every institution, every everybody needs to get off zero. And so the more you learn about it, the more you understand it, the more you, you get that. And, and, and I I'm actually changing my mind a little bit, right? In the sense that, you know, you, you convinced me that, that maybe my stance that, that an open airdrop at the very beginning, while to me still would have been better, um, probably would have resulted in the same thing. You know, Russia tried that with their voucher system. They airdropped all their state assets to everybody and the, you know, the mafia went around with guns and took them from a lot of the the peasants. Um, I shouldn't say peasants, the, the populace. Yeah. Um, the mafia treated them like peasants. Yeah. Or the oligarchs, they're not the mafia, the oligarchs. Uh, used my my phrases right. Uh, but the oligarchs got all got all the money. Um, so probably the same thing would have happened here. But but ultimately, as people convert what currency they have into this better store of value, we will get equilibration of, of ownership. And I do think we need to go to SATs, right? That's why my, my, uh, my hand or on, handle on Twitter is at Mark Yusko, hashtag 2.1 quadrillion. Because there's two point one quadrillion sats and that's plenty for everybody. Yeah, I'd almost, almost even say we need like a middle yeah. unit, like bits or something, maybe yeah. a few decimal yes. places in. Yeah, that's a good idea too. All right. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on. You you spit a lot of fire there at the end. And I, I mean fiat really does fund endless wars, right? Because they can just pay the troops until the money loses all value, which they wouldn't they be able do. to do with Look, straight taxation. War is war is profitable. Um and we can't pay for it. You know, Janet Yellen said on TV of course we can afford two wars. No, we can't, Jan. We have a trillion dollar deficit mm -hmm. right now. We have a trillion dollar deficit with a T, a trillion. That's a dollar every second for 31,710 years. That's a shit ton of money. And we can't afford, we can't even afford what we do now. What, what you're saying is we, the people in charge, want to launder a lot of money and get really rich. That's what you're saying. It's not about affording war. War is a way of money laundering for wealthy people. Because what happens, and Mitch McConnell even says it's crazy. He says, we're not sending money to Ukraine. We wire money to Ukraine. They wire it back to companies oh, that just happen to be <laughs> in the districts where the, where the senators were and uh, service. Mm -hmm. And they happen to have bought stock of a couple of weeks before the war exactly, gets announced. Exactly. Exactly. We just got, we just got announced. So, but it's been going on forever. Uh, it's not going to stop. Um, well, it just won't stop. Humans are going to human. And yeah. um, humans in power, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And uh, you say you don't think a Bitcoin standard fixes that human error, human greed? It certainly makes it better. But, but again, you're still going to have the problem of unequal distribution and self organization. Humans organize into structures yeah they always have they always will uh when the powerful want to control the weak and the powerful like using leverage to get richer and bitcoin if everybody were on if everyone were on bitcoin instead of fiat would be it would be harder to devalue everybody's ownership through money printing but it wouldn't stop in fact I don't even like to think about this, but it, it might take us back to the bad old days where the bigger your gun, the more you had, right? And so I don't know. I would still say the that. world's kind of like that in a way, right. right? The bigger your missiles and your nukes, the more you're going to have. Oh, for sure. But, but that's not individual, individual, hand to hand. Yeah. Like, like in the old days, if you were on your, your farm out in, in the, on the range and somebody drove by and they had bigger guns. They just shot you. Yeah. They just took your stuff because there wasn't enough law enforcement. There wasn't enough rule of law. And in some ways, that threat of violence by governments check most people. Like, we still have crime. Yeah. You know, don't, don't get me wrong. But by and large, 
you know, things run pretty smoothly. People pay attention to traffic lights and yeah. you know, people don't rob banks very often and and planes fly without getting hijacked. And so I, you know, I don't, the elimination of, of all governments and a singular virtual nation state, I don't know how that would work. I don't think anybody knows how it would work. Mm-hmm. It comes, could be utopia. Yeah. I mean, it comes back to a point you made at the very beginning, which is like a lot of governments, they start with good intentions. Like we're going to finally do government and, you know, it's civil rule setting the right way. And it always just erodes into corrupt humans corrupting everything. But I guess that's what make, makes Bitcoin beautiful because no one human or no group of humans can change the protocol. I do like that. Yeah. I do. Although I guess I've been told that's not 100% true. Um because you you can change it, people like like even the cap, right? I mean, developers could could change it. Um, I mean, my node would reject that. It's very I very understand. difficult yeah. to change. Yeah, yeah. No, no, not 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 that it's not difficult, and but but I guess it's not impossible. So yeah, um, I do think it's unlikely, but you know, there already have been changes. Mm-hmm. Right? We have Taproot, we have Segwit, um, all improvements and enhancements. Um, but there's a, there's again topic for another day. But there's the whole argument that you know when the halvings end in 2140, uh, we won't have enough incentive for the miners to mine, so we're going to have to have transaction fees, or we can increase and keep mining. So yeah, topic for another day. Yeah, for sure. I think we could probably go on for a couple more hours on this. I've really right. enjoyed talking to you, Mark. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, yes, sir.